Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca. I'm a fish biologist, an ichthyologist, and also a PhD student specialising in studying the evolution of laurel coloured catfishes. So those are also known as plecos in the trade. Ignore this laptop on the side, that's just running uh, some computer codes at the moment. So I've got this on so it doesn't actually like switch off. Um, so today I'm going to talk about some very well-known laurel cards that many people have kept and there's probably a little bit of misinformation on the two different genera that I'm dealing with. So the first one is going to be Panax and then secondly is Panaculus. So two very similar morphologically but very different um, evolutionary and in uh, phylogenetic so it's the sort of family tree of laurel cards and plecos in general. So I am dealing with preserved specimens, so these have been fixed in formalin and then preserved later in alcohols. Um, they are ethically sore, so I should state that anyway. So here we've got Panaculus, the much smaller fish, and Panac, the much larger. This is not a fully grown Panac, but this is a fully grown Panaculus albivermis, and also known as Flash Pleco. This is a Panac Cochidon, also known as the blue-eyed um, Panac. Um, or blue-eyed, just a blue-eyed blue -eyed in general, I think. Um, but it's a very distinctive fish it, um, as well. So, and this certainly is nowhere near fully grown. So first, locality, these are exclusive to South America. Um, I think they're both pretty well um, widespread. And they tend to be found in, well, definitely in habitats that inhabit or have a lot of wooden. This isn't always the case. I don't think um, the Panak found in the Zingu River or Xingu River actually has as much wood. So definitely not dependent on it. These guys are the little Panak that's often um, associated, I think, with a lot of black water, I guess. But generally, that's not always the case. They're still very diverse in the habitats they can inhabit. They're quite... Um, well, adaptable in general, but I'm more interested here in talk about the morphology of them. So I think I'll start. Um, I'll start talking about the size. So Panac, this is the largest of the two um, groups, or largest of the two genera. So Panac grows anywhere from 30 centimeters to 60 centimeters standard length, depending on the species. The smallest is Panac bathyphilus at 30 centimeters standard length. Bear in mind that both genera have quite large caudal extensions, so they're going to get much bigger than that, especially in the right setup and with the right care. Panaculus, on the other hand, is a much smaller ge uh, genus. It grows anywhere from around oh. Uh, I would say probably 7 centimetres, 5 centimetres standard length, all the way up to about 15 centimetres standard length, with the largest being uh, Panaculus albivermis, a flash perco, Panaculus nocturnus, a Panaculus albumaculatus, which is the mustard spot pleco, and so it's a much smaller genus um, in body size, and I think it is quite a lot larger actually in numbers of species present. So. These guys are actually very distantly related in the fact that they're two completely different branches. Panax are more closely related to Barry and Sistra, so that's like the Gold Nugget, the Magnum, Pleco. But also, um, in that sort of, it's a, a branch out a lot earlier than um, some others in that group, such as the Hemian Sistra subverdis, um, and the other green phantom known as uh, Barry and Sistra stematoides. These guys actually, if you look at them more closely, so if I try and get it to focus, so th these guys actually look a lot like Picoltia, and that's because they're actually basically really closely related to Picoltia and Ancystemus, and also therefore Hypostemus, um, Hypensistus, sorry, because they're both in that um, clade um, of the pe uh, Pico Picoltia clade. Whereas these guys, so they're not even closely related, they just share a similar niche. And they don't entirely look similar at all. This guy should be striped, um, but obviously formalin does bleach um, colouration. Uh, depends on the colouration and how long it's been in their natural individual situation. 
So shape and morphology, these guys are a lot deeper, these guys vary depending on, so Pinaculus varies depending on the actual species uh, we're talking about, uh, Pinaculus macus, for example the clown pleco is a lot more short and stumpy, um, it, well that's how to describe it really, they are more um, elongate, well Pinaculus macus itself is a little bit more elongate than the ones we see in the trade anyway, but uh, Pinac itself, their names are so similar, um, is, I call them floating heads because they are just so large, the head takes up a, and they get quite deep I think, particularly like uh, Panac Nigro Lineatus, Panac, um, uh, so all the different royals really, Umbrustae, they get quite deep and they do lose those sort of striped colourations, especially as they get really old. Um, both have quite heavy odontoid growth. I don't think it's particularly sexually dimorphic in um, Panac, which if you look at the other members are related um, of genera like Baron Cistrus, the um, Hemian Cistrus, like not true Hemian Cistrus, they do have heavy odontoid growth but it's not really sexually dimorphic. You really got to look at genital propelia and natural body shape. This one I assume was male. Um, just look at the head shape and then the genital propelia, which is on the bottom, genital pore, when it was still alive. So, the dontoids you'll see here, we've got the... So these are the hypertrophic... So hypertrophic dontoids just means they're larger. But these are the dontoids at the gila percla, these are invertible. Um, this fish it still might be possible to actually avert them because he wasn't informal in that long. But you can see there's a little bit of mobility actually, maybe on the other side. But they can really stick these out and they're quite formidable. Uh, just trying to work out. Yeah, so there's a bit of movement. But these ones, so these ones are probably used mostly in defence. Um, but actually most of them, and maybe just to make it, they're more difficult to eat. They can wedge in a spot quite well. And I think particularly these ones, so these are the dontos on the pectoral fins. And these are particularly large in this individual, and I think it does change somewhat seasonally. But these are definitely going to help if they're going to want to wedge in a bit of rock, um, rock wood and not come out. Whereas if we look at Panaculus, the much smaller jet species, oh well, genus in body size, um, this one has not the best to show odontoid growth, but I probably should have videos or photos of one that does um, but usually you'll see quite heavy or large growth around that caudal peduncle area so that's the area sort of between the anal fin and the um, caudal fin and also at that pectoral um, at the pectoral spine or pectoral fin which there but you can't really see it in this individual. They do change a lot seasonally, um, and I think this is female. It doesn't have, it does have a donto growth at the gila percula, you can see here. Doesn't help that. Oh, just broke a load of odontos. Um So if I just, it's probably easy to actually see here, if I do that, you can kind of see those are dontoids at the gila percula. Just... Oh, my finger's just getting in the way. But yeah, they have quite large dontoids there. Um, these tend to be a little bit more hairy. They're, it's not hair at all, it's uh, dentine. So they're kind of external teeth but not used as teeth. But you can definitely see massive differences. These guys have that sort of very high peak at the head. Um, whereas these guys it's a little less so and they're, they're quite variable particularly in patterning a uh, panaculus obviously you get striped individuals so panaculus albivermis a panaculus tanky a uh, panaculus well a lot of them there's also spotted with so panaculus albomaculatus even albivermis does get spotted with age um, and then these guys so this is probably the most distinctive or well two species actually are most distinctive in terms of unusual coloration. So the Panac Cochlidon is the one you'll find in the trades, it's the blue eye Panac. There's also Panac uh, Sartoni, 
Um, sometimes Suttonium uh, depends on I think the, whether the genus is feminine or masculine. Um, they have that solid dark coloration, uh, light sort of bluish eyes and the dontos are quite obvious. But there's the stripes of Panac um, Nigro lineatus, which the name kind of hints at, the lineatus part. And then you've also got Panac um, Umbrustei that also has the stripes. Uh, Spots Nigro lineatus does have that watermelon variant, um, L330 I think it is. That is a bit more spotted, but there's definitely sort of like two variants when it comes to markings on I guess I can think of any others, but there tend, there's some that are a little bit more solid coloured. Panak Bathy Phyllis has to be one of my favourites though. But what makes these fishes the most distinctive? So both Panakus and uh, Panak. So I don't have the another genus or group that I need, would be also nice to compare. But if we look closely at these jaws. So if I get it really close to the camera then please focus. Yeah, you can see that the jaws, they look a little bit like um, other genera, so they're um, sort of quite short. It's a bit like Hypencystris and Picoltia. And also, let's see, oh, it's really difficult to see on the panaculus. Oh, there's a, there's a load of tissue that's broken off. Um, because it's just such a smaller fish. No, you can't really see it, but I use Panaclis as the example because they're very similar teeth um, and jaws. And then if we compare it to, so this is, um, so this is Tyriopleictes josimanus. Oh, oh. So this one is dry, so it does change the morphology a little bit. But you've got similar shaped jaws, but the teeth is where it is most distinctive. They do both have very strong um, jaws. Which I'm trying to get a comparison is, but you can see like these guys have a much smaller tooth plate in general, or yeah, tooth plate, and then also the shape of the teeth. These guys have elongate teeth, they're uh, Tyriopleictes, Common Pleco, uh, Selvin Pleco, all of those, um, Gold Spot Pleco, they're mostly eating on algae, detritus, but detritus on the surface in a substrate, something like this. That these guys though. So both Panaclis and pa Panac, I've done a video on it, you can watch it for actually looking at the references and the citations. These guys are using their jaws to actually get into wood. So these guys are using these jaws to get into wood and a lot of people will kind of mistake it for actually eating the wood or digesting the wood, which we see all sorts of behaviours throughout the animal kingdom when it comes to feeding um, so I'm passing through the gut, whether it has a purpose or not, it might be a byproduct. For example, if um, a lot of animals might not process uh, uh, feathers and hair particularly well, so it's just going to go straight through the gut and not be uptaken. But it's going to be there, so it could confuse people that they're actually going to be eating that. Although um, sort of hair, bone, stuff like that tends to not be processed, uh, like it doesn't look like the same as the waste. So these guys are actually, when we look at their jaws, they are utilising that wood. You can see it's quite strong, quite distinctive. If I get it up again, just so people can... They're very round, spoon-shaped teeth, just to get into that wood. But they are actually just digesting the fungi, the bacteria, the microbes within the wood. And we know that through isotopic analysis that they are not actually digesting any of that wood. They're not really, um, the wood is passing through their gut as a byproduct. But the difference is when we compare to, say, Tyriopleictes, um, they're not closely related particularly, but um, they're, they've been compared in papers before just because I guess both are. This is quite an easy one to get. It's a generalist detritivore. These guys are detritivores, but they're using the wood um, to find their food. Where other fishes, so Tyriopleictes, um, or even like Hypencystrus, um, Baryoncystrus, they can't get into the wood to find what these guys are finding. So these guys are feeding somewhere other animals can't get, and they're avoiding competition by that sort of manner. 
which I think is as brilliant as if they were feeding on wood because it shows that there is like partitioning in feeding on the, the set they're eating the same sort of organisms just in different places um, and it means they don't have to compete so and the habitat therefore generally quite a few are found around wood mostly um, it just they're not digesting the wood um, generally reasonable flow uh, particularly like I think in general for lower cars, some like Tyroplichthys can deal very low oxygen levels just because they can vacuously air breathe. I don't think all lower cards can. So just a good amount of current. The good thing about both of these is they're not always, they uh, don't always need the highest temperatures, it really depends where they come from. So always think about that. Um, they're definitely not going to be cold water at all. Um, so their habitat I, is definitely going to be, and I've done videos on pe different panaculus. I haven't done it particularly on panac because I've talked about the diet so much and I think that's the main part. So what would I do in captivity? So I would provide wood as a behavioural enrichment. That means that they will be producing quite a lot of like wood shavings, wood litter, which does mean extra cleaning, particularly for panac which has those stronger jaws, likely to dig, uh, they, I would dig further into wood than the smaller panaculus. And with panaculus there is a bit of variation, so I find particularly panaculus albivermis tends to delve further into the wood and break down more wood. Then uh, panaculus macus, so um, albivermis, and all the elongate panaculus, um, compared to macus the clown pleco. So, wood out of the way really, I would so the other aspect of that actually would be that um, the thing with wood is that does it have the microbes, does it have the fungi in captivity and that's highly unlikely. I think it's generally because of the woods we choose to put in the aquariums aren't um, already like decaying or growing as much uh, biota. A lot of aquariums for a variety of reasons won't ever have that introduction of the biota that would start decaying it that these guys are feeding on and it's been shown that in studies they do lose weight when only fed on wood but also people do treat their tanks if you ever need to treat for something then you're going to be destroying that biota um, within the wood and I think the reason why so many of these, uh, this species, or this genus, particularly Panac, doesn't grow so well in captivity is because of the size of them, therefore the amount they need to eat. Um, and that kind of means that they're not going to get as much nutrition as they need. They do need a lot of food. So definitely a captive diet. I say something like Vipashi Soylent Green, Vipashi Super Green, because we don't have a replica for bacteria. Um, and the algaes will give similar-ish nutrition and they're going to probably eat quite a bit of algae in the wild. And then also something like mushrooms or um, any sort of fungi that, well, I think generally the only ones you can really buy are mushrooms. And giving a different sort of a variation in different um, mushrooms and not just uh, your sort of common ones but also like shiitake and stuff. So they do get that fungus in the wild to give a go at. And they're quite hardy in general, both of them are. They just need a lot of food, I think. And they do need to be fed. Just having a tank with wood isn't going to provide enough food. And a lot of the wood that will be in uh, the wild has probably been there for a very long time. One thing you could experiment with is certain like dead woods. If you can sort of identify the species of the wood and that it's safe and maybe adding it into a larger tank and seeing how that works particularly for panac I think um, for their behavioural enrichment there is a strong um, thing when it comes to food hardness as well affecting how fish's um, morphology effect, um, develops so definitely think about um, using that wood for behaviour as well rather than just diet because it's not part of their diet. These are probably some of the most misunderstood fish regarding, or a uh, lot cards regarding diet, other than people saying that they, none eat, um, they don't eat algae, because most of them do. Um, 
so I end this video here. Um, if you like my videos, please comment, like, and subscribe. And if anyone has any questions, then I should be happy to answer them. And thank you.